to one in every three species of marine animals. Coral ecosystems are the rainforests of the sea, but two thirds of corals worldwide have already disappeared. And with global warming expected to likely exceed 1.5 degrees centigrade within the decade, we risk losing those that remain in the next 10 years. Even if we meet the most ambitious climate mitigation targets, Reducing greenhouse emissions and improving local marine conservation measures can help, but are not enough. The G20 has agreed to establish a global coral research and development accelerator platform to bring together the best scientific minds to scale up next generation science and technology solutions before it's too late. We ask that you join us for our oceans, to protect the economies and societies that depend on corals and to help secure a future for them. Ready to go? Good morning, everybody. My name is Carol Pua. From, I'm from WWF, and I lead the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative, and I'll be a moderator today. Um, it is a joint event today between ICRI, CORDEP, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, WWF, and the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative. Co-moderating with me today is uh, Fabian Cousteau, and I'll just get Fabian to say, say a few words. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be amongst all of you. Thank you uh, for letting me co-moderate. Uh, I look forward to uh, insights and solutions, and uh, here you go. So um, today we're going to have the pleasure of hearing from very um, distinguished global experts on what is the situation with regards to coral reefs and climate change. And we have a fantastic panel lined up for you today and some wonderful partners in the room to share the information and also think about where do we go with the information that's been provided and how do we work together on this global challenge. So to kick us off today, uh, I'd just like you to welcome um, the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean, Ambassador Peter Thompson who actually encouraged us to organize this event, um, just to keep front of mind that this is a huge global challenge that will require all of us working together. If you put your hands together, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks very much, Carol. And uh, sorry we're stating, starting late. It's my fault. Uh, I actually got my prime minister from Fiji coming in at the event right next door here, and I'm trying to make sure that he does come in here as well. But unlike this room, which is packed, uh, that room is pretty much empty, so <laughs> I've got to be careful not to steal him. Uh, so anyway, I've got people that hopefully will bring him through to hear from us, because as you know, coral uh, is uh, absolutely existential for Fiji. Uh, as some of you may know, I come from Fiji. Uh, all of our islands are surrounded by coral reefs. Uh, it's kind of unimaginable to us that there would be a world without coral reefs. I mean, it's kind of reason to exist, you know. It's like saying there are going to be no trees. Uh, so the sad fact is, and, you know, we've had this now from the best of our scientists, 
that uh, coral reefs, majority of them, will be gone this century uh, if we stay on the current track. Even on the current track, they're in great jeopardy. Uh, so the current track is uh, going to somewhere between two and three degrees before the end of this century, global warming. Uh, that's a world of uh, fire and plague. It's a world of droughts driving people from continents, whole continents. Uh, it's a world of wars. And that's why we're bequeathing our grandchildren. <clears throat> and those of you that have grandchildren like me know that's the reason to get up in the morning and do things, to try and rectify. Uh, on Sunday, I was on the beach in Casavelas here with the Secretary General Guterres for the Youth Forum. And to the hundreds of youth representatives present and the tens of thousands beaming in from around the world, uh, Mr. Guterres said, uh, on behalf of my generation, and remember this is the Secretary General of the United Nations, arguably the leader of humanity, on behalf of my generation, I want to deeply, deeply, deeply apologize for what our generation has done to this planet and what we are bequeathing to you in your lives, in your lifetimes. So that's the situation we're in. You know, it's been described as a red alert for humanity. And uh, for people like us in Fiji, seeing the coral reefs dying, it's like, uh, yeah, we feel that uh, <laughs> almost uh, unbelievable thing is going to happen. But the good news for us is we do have a resilient reef up in the north of Fiji, uh, one of the world's biggest, actually. And there are others, of course, around the world which are being identified by WWF and others as reefs that we've got to protect, uh, do what is necessary to help them survive because, you know, we're up against the ocean acidification, up against the global warming, but there's a lot that we can do locally to help them survive, keep them resilient. And uh, also those resilient reefs may in fact be the means by which we can get things back. Who knows, in uh, 100 years or 1,000 years, you know, as long as we've got some healthy reefs, uh, the day may come when we have done sufficiently good things on this planet that uh, we can start bringing coral reefs back to what they once were. And of course that's mainly about the transition to renewable energy. And if there's anybody still driving a car that emits greenhouse gas emissions, please stop. I won't make my list because it would sound too much like preaching, but my wife and I, when we were living in New York, been big beef eaters all our lives. One day we looked at a photograph of our grandchildren and the latest report on what beef was doing to the Amazon and doing to the planet. And we said, hey, which do we love more? So we gave up our hamburgers that day and never touched beef or veal since. It makes travel to Italy rather difficult. Everything seems to be veal on the menu. <laughs> <coughs> so look, uh, we've got uh, world's best here in this room with us on this subject, and it's not for me to take up too much of your time, other than to say, you know, we have this red alert situation. So uh, listen to what's said today, and let's go away and put it all into action. I think as President Kenyatta said yesterday, this week is, when you get down to it, really about finance. You know, obviously, we're, we're supposed to be finding science-based solutions for the ocean's problems. That goes right across the gamut, um, perhaps led as a poster child, unfortunately, by coral. But when we get those solutions identified, and those solutions are coming through quite clearly, uh, at the end of the day, you need money to make them happen in most cases. Of course, you need political will. Of course, you need people on the beach picking up the plastic and uh, going out and replanting. You need all that. But you also need the finance to make it all happen. And we're on our way to Sharm El Sheikh in November to uh, make sure that $100 billion comes across. But in the meantime, you know, all of us have got a bit of money jingling in our pockets that we can put to the right thing. And why would we be doing that rather than buying another bottle of Chardonnay or taking the next holiday on the beach? Because it's intergenerational justice. It's, it's, 
just wrong that we should be enjoying ourselves when our grandchildren are not going to be able to. So um, what you're doing here is really important in this room. Uh, we're going to capture the findings of this. I was at a coral breakfast here yesterday. All the good ideas on coral, really important to the outcomes of this conference. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, sir. So I'll call upon our first speaker, if we could get the slide deck ready, please. Professor Ofu Golba from the University of Queensland, uh, from the Center of Coral Reef Studies, and who's also a chief scientist for the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative. <laughs> please don't. Right, you can hear me. Well, let, let me first thank uh, Ambassador Thompson for those wise words and to also recognise his presence and that of the Prime Minister of Fiji, uh, eventually. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all of you who are a very distinguished crowd here that have taken time out from your schedules uh, to be here today. Well, um, I'm here really just to talk about the latest science in terms of um, coral reefs and climate change. And while I would have hoped that it had got a lot better, it's obviously very dire at the moment. We're seeing things that we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago happen on reefs today. And I just want to go through these points. I mean, the first one, just to say, this is worth the fight. Uh, it's 0.1% of the uh, bottom of the ocean. It provides enormous amounts of benefits to to humans and ecosystems and so on. So it's something worth fighting for. And if only for the 500 million people or so who depend on coral reefs heavily for food income and, and, and coastal protection, there's no question this is a really, really vital um, planetary resource. Now, you'd hope that if that were the case, then we'd be looking after them and we wouldn't have reefs in decline. But what has happened since, uh, the, you know, over the last decade has really been quite shocking. Um, we already knew uh, at the beginning of this last decade that 50% of corals uh, and coral reefs ha had disappeared over the previous 30 years, and that's just been going on. But I was personally shocked when this very uh, rigorous and careful report from the Global Change, uh, so the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, came out and said that it's, 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 pay it's, it's increasing in speed and that, that we've lost 14% of coral reefs since 2009. And the reasons are both local and global, but global has been growing in significance. And I take you to this story here, which is the Great Barrier Reef in 2016, 2017 and 2020, when we had a mass coral bleaching event on par with the only one we'd ever had, which was in 1998, uh, occur in a five-year period. And just to give you an idea and, and, and make sure that Marco knows the significance of this uh, slide, that, the Great Barrier Reef is the size of Italy, and half of it in these cases was, was more than bleached. And then we had these mortality rates, and so when you look at these uh, changes on reefs like this one, this is just an image coming from 2017 from the Centre for Excellence. You can see there's a tiny tweaking of temperature, and you have corals um, essentially falling apart and dying on, on huge scales. And so this really is something that we are failing. If we were to get a grade for, for our work here, we're failing. Number of reefs saved, a lot less than we wanted. When you go to the IPCC, and I've been involved with this process for about 15 years, they do the best at sort of um, getting a consensus, essentially, of, of what's going on. It comes as a surprise to a lot of people when they're told that um, if we achieve the Paris uh, uh, <coughs> objectives, we still lose 70 to 90 percent of the coral reefs we have today. Uh, and that if we were to let things go to two degrees, we'd be seeing 99. And of course, that's pretty devastating and might actually uh, lead you to sort of thinking that, well, it's too late, it's time to be forgive. And if, even if we could, which we can't, because we depend on reefs really heavily for our own existence, uh, this idea is that it's, 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 it's actually more about the 10% saved in this case as opposed to the 90% lost. We've been really focusing on that 90% and, 
And that 10% is where I think the action is. And if we can focus our resources and strategies, then I think we have a good um, uh, opportunity of, of uh, you know, getting to the point where we've managed the emissions and we've now got coral reefs starting to grow back as the climate stabilises. Now, you may think I've been drinking too much cordial, but I mean, that still is in reach. And I think we have to go for it because there is no other option with respect to uh, coral reefs. Refugia, that 10% is not all in an, an even spread across the planet. It's actually in isolated circumstances. And uh, Serge will see that paper that he... Serge, where are you? There he is. Um, they've identified the idea that there's quite significant delays in some parts of the ocean getting as hot as the rest of the ocean, if you like. So they're acting as thermal refugia. <coughs> and so this then becomes an opportunity to uh, perhaps detect where they are and then provide protection. Re reduce the local stresses that are causing them to uh, teeter on the edge. And so to do this, uh, we, we had the 50 Reefs project, uh, which uh, brought a whole bunch of scientists together, and, and David Abur is here, and various other. You had a good time, wasn't it? It's hard to, hard to go to Hawaii and, and not enjoy the place. But in this case, it was a, a mission to find out what variables, particularly from satellites, and Jennifer Koss is here, uh, that you could use to sort of um, uh, get a measure of climate exposure. So once you know that that's going to be low, then that's a place that you might then protect. And that then led to this fascinating diagram where 18 different metris, met, met, metrics of uh, exposure to climate change were combined and weighted and, and then the simulations run. And then you get a map like this which shows the least exposed to climate change regions, the blue bits, versus the red bits, which are where climate is moving fast and, and, and perhaps isn't a good place to sort of work. So you look at that, and it actually makes sense because you've got the heart of Indonesia being fairly stable and the southern Great Barrier Reef. Now, both of those places, when you visit them, have maintained quite healthy coral populations, not like you see in the northern part of uh, Japan and, uh, and so on. So there's really something in this, and this then led to the... Uh, initiative led by uh, Carol Poor uh, and WWF to sort of say, well, where are these reefs and how do we then protect them at, at various scales? So you can protect them at the sort of political scale, you can protect them at the sort of village scale. And once you understood where those places are, then to put in place the sort of measures you have to have to save these reefs from local stresses, so all the pollution. It, it essentially targets the efficiency of your interventions. And so this was launched in 20, 2020, uh, and various people around the room here have contributed to this. And, and at the end of the day, we've ended up with a sort of a manifesto, I think you'd call it, and that is that if we're to have impact and scale like we haven't had so far, then we really need to invest in that outer ring to ensure that we do have healthy uh, 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 land and seascapes, that we have resilient communities, that we have sustainable blue economies, that we have networked solutions, and that we catalyse the sort of change we need to have. And so I'll finish with that uh, here. Thanks. Thanks, Ove. Following um, Ove, I've got Dr. David Obura from Cordio, East Africa, to present... Um, an additional narrative to what Ove just presented as well and what's happening in coastal East Africa. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carol. Uh, good morning to all. It's a, it's a real honor to be here uh, speaking to you, so thank you for this opportunity. It's always tough to follow Ove in a presentation. He's taken most of my messages. <laughs> not, no, that's not true. Um, but yes, so my basis of work as a coral reef scientist, some of you know, working in East Africa and the Western Indian Ocean, um, folks on coral reefs, an ecosystem we love so much, uh, has gone into how valuable they are at the beginning. I don't think we really need to, to impress that on anyone in the room here. I think you all understand how magnificent reefs are for their own sake and also for people. Um, and I think the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative has done a great job of pulling together some of the key information that you know, really tells us how important these systems are and why we should work on them. Now, the work that I've been doing since actually the Coral Reef Rescue or the 50 Reefs project, um, in a way, has been coming to 
this side of, of how do we deal with this challenge? And I have a very boring presentation. This is my one slide, and there'll be some text coming up. Because I think it's really important to, as we move out from the space of where we work in the coral reef world, to really see how uh, the work that we do impacts on other sectors, how important it is, how other sectors impact on us, and how we leverage the strengths from other sectors as well in terms of trying to, to um, achieve what we would like to achieve. And really the real question is, is how to transform to a reef positive future. I think Ove has explained really well the importance of that 10%. And I think it's really important, as in these sessions now, is to have that realism, as expressed by Ambassador Thompson. We, we really do know that we're getting to a state of uh, having perhaps 10% of reefs remaining, perhaps less than that. Uh, the science will tell us over time what retention or recovery is possible. Um, and, but I have a very strong interest, and, and, and we must absolutely do what we can in those 10 or 5% remaining as, as things move forward into the future. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a Kenyan scientist and working on African conditions. And, of course, I'm, I'm very conscious of, of course, what happens in that 10% is very affected by what still is happening in that other 90%. And, of course, all those people uh, that depend on reefs in those places will be, still be dependent on those emerging ecosystems in those other places. Not to distract from our focus, but to really understand how we, how we contextualize our work uh, across, across space. The critical thing, as, as expressed by Ove, is this addressing drivers, um, the direct and indirect drivers of what are really causing this problem. And unless we dial back on that accelerator of growth, uh, we, none of the restoration actions or none of the protection actions we can put in place will be as effective as they could be unless we dial that back. And I think the, both the IPBES, which I'm working with a lot now, uh, is very much involved in the global assessment a few years ago. And in thinking about where to move to in trying to generate action in coral reefs uh, where they matter and for the people, I've taken on board a lot more of IPBES responsibilities. There's a, a nexus assessment coming up now in, in a few years, looking at the nexus between climate, biodiversity, health, water, and food for people, and of course everything else with the SDGs. And I realize that that's where I want to be in two or three years in terms of being a publishing scientist and trying to influence action out there in the world at, at the top levels. So I took on board to co-chair this assessment because I think in terms of the leverage of what I can contribute as a coral reef scientist based in Africa with my background, this is where I can really contribute to, to, to moving that dial, pulling back on that accelerator. So to really help make sure that the 10% survives and that the other 90% is in as good shape as it can be. And then the other critical important there, which I think is very much on everybody's agenda in the room as well, and we're very conscious of that, and all our programs are moving towards this, is the equity dimensions. It's, you know, for whom are we doing this work, uh, by whom as well, and the sorts of decision-making processes that really connect the local action on a reef to the global priorities and the global capabilities and resources that we can bring to bear. So for that, I've really been working with the Earth Commission. It's part of the Global Commons Alliance, which some of you are very aware of, um, and partners in that and really understanding how do we move towards a safe and just world. So it's not just about biodiversity being intact, um, but where is it and for whom and who benefits. It's about reversing repairing damage. Um, and dialing back on this accelerator is really about over-extraction, over-consumption over the last 50 years in the global system that we have put in place and that we need to transform. So that's a lot about inter internalizing these externalities the CO2 out there, the overconsumption, the pollution, and so on, and understanding how we reinvest the wealth that we accumulate, we transform from nature into manufactured capital in amazing places. You know, a lot of that needs to be reinvested. A lot of the finance that we're trying to identify, and I think the finance people in the room here really understand that as well. We can have this, the thin end of the wedge as a finance we can generate in, in programs and initiatives like this, but we need to get all companies, all corporations to really be reinvesting a major part of, of what they earn from nature in coral reef places, but back into sustaining those places. So I think I'll finish with that uh, and moving to sort of the people side of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I love hearing David talk about what's happening in coastal East Africa and some of the great work that they're doing in Cordio as well. Um, we'll have a Q&A session after um, Jennifer's presentation as well. So next, oh no, so Carlos first, sorry. I'm so sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> next up, we have Professor Carlos Duarte. Oh no, Jennifer is first. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> 
Jeez, Dr. Jennifer Koss from NOAA, co-chair for ICRI. Thank you, Jennifer. Trust the slides always, eh? Thank you very much for, for having me speak. I'm going to be wearing a couple of different hats here, and it's, it's a true pleasure to be here and to address such a august body of, of folks here. Um, now that Ove and David have set the scene and talked about what's happening, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to go about doing these important things to make sure that corals persist into the future? Um, I think Ove alluded to it. Corals are sort of that too big to fail. We really can't afford to lose them. It's not an option. So what are the things that we're going to pull out of our collective bag of tricks to, to make sure that we keep corals going? Um, I will advance here into this next slide. Um, the United States took over the chairmanship of the International Coral Reef Initiative, I think, last year. And um, in that year, we've written a new plan of action. And you can see broadly these themes. These are the type of things that we're going to be doing through the general membership of ICRI, along with some exciting partners that I'll get to at the end of this slide. So theme one there is really about strengthening policies, um, building capacity for resilience-based management. Resilience-based management takes into account what's happening today and what will happen tomorrow. You can't just manage for today. You have to manage for what your conditions are going to be in the future. Um, and really increasing the capacity for restoration of resilient species of corals. We've talked a lot about resilience today already. <clears throat> the second theme is really to <clears throat> take the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network to the next step. The um, report that Ove showed, the common indicator that all of our nodes have is that we could talk about coral cover. There's so many other indicators of health and resilience and also decline um, with coral reefs. We need to be able to talk more about the other stressors and the other things that are going on reefs to better be able to manage them. The third theme is about integrating planning. In um, a lot of areas, folks have plans for disasters, plans for restoration, plans for their watershed management. We're trying to integrate those plans into holistic things so that you're thinking about the reef as an ecosystem, but as it also relates to land and really providing more integrated planning tools for people to, so as not to overwhelm them with a myriad of different plans. And then the last theme is really about connecting with youth and other um, audiences, non-traditional audiences in some cases, and then also connecting with indigenous peoples and incorporating the knowledge that they have into management plans. Um, and in order to facilitate all of that, we're gonna need more resources. So I'm excited that ICRI has um, has a couple of new members, and that would be CORDAP, which Carlos will talk about, really exciting um, funding program to really increase technology and ability to do restoration and other management actions at scale, and then the um, Global Coral Refund, which you'll hear about a lot over the, the, the coming days. Um, just a small example from NOAA in terms of how, how do you do all these things? How do you incorporate resilience into planning, you need good data and, and things like ecological forecasts. NOAA's Coral Reef Watch Program um, is an ecological forecasting tool where we've been able to um, create a product that forecasts out to four months the likelihood of a coral reef bleaching and then the closer you get to that bleaching event, how severe might that event be? And, and the importance there is not just to say, my reef might bleach, it's what am I going to do about it. Um, the, the Coral Reef Watch product doesn't tell you conclusively that your, your reef is going to bleach. It's a little bit too broad in its resolution to do that. doesn't take into account local um, resilience, refugia places, and also doesn't take into account maybe you, you have a very beneficial tsunami, or not a tsunami, um, <laughs> a hurricane or typhoon um, that comes through that cools the waters and actually prevents your bleaching, but it is definitely a great um, diagnostic tool to figure out, do I need to take further management action during a period of high stress? This was meant to be a, um, a looped, and I think we probably had to go with the static slide, but <clears throat> it was just to show you that the Coral Reef Watch product maps heat stress as it moves around the globe, and it's rather fascinating to watch it. So. Um, hopefully you can get on the website and take a look at it just to see how heat stress moves um, around each ocean basin and strengthens in, at different times of the year. 
Um, so bottom line for managers is, is my reef going to bleach? What can I do about it? During periods of high stress, we've seen different countries use the information in different ways. We know that <clears throat> in Thailand, for instance, when high stress events are likely to happen, they, they change their management of their marine parks. They'll l allow less visitorship so that there's less human impact. Um, <clears throat> and then the last slide here, sorry, um, is, is what can we do to improve tools like that when you have best available science? We would really like to take our Coral Reef Watch program to be also a predictive tool for where you'll find resilient reefs based on what we know about um, chronic bleaching patterns. And then once you've done that, how do you best preserve and sustain those reefs? So with that, I'm going to end. And hopefully, on a high note, I really do think not only is this the time that we have to do things, I think we're capable of actually turning the ship around. Thank you, Jennifer. Next up, we have Professor Carlos Duarte from King Abdullah University and was also leading the work at CORDAP. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Ayan. I would like to start by thanking uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson for bringing us all together here. I think there's, uh, in this last stand for coral reefs, there are many things that are important. One of them is that we are all together in this room. ICRI, uh, WWF, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, CORDAP, we are working together. We are not doing our own independent show. We are acting together to uh, secure a future for coral reefs. And I very much sympathize with uh, Ambassador Thompson's comment that this is a matter of justice, and uh, David has brought this, uh, this uh, point uh, strongly to the table, and it's a matter of intergenerational justice. So we cannot accept that our children and grandchildren uh, grow in, a, in an ocean devoid and depleted of coral reefs. So we often, often say that coral reefs are the rainforest of the ocean. And as coral reefs bleach with climate change, then rainforests are increasingly vulnerable to wildfires. And we're losing forests in Australia, in the Amazonia, in California, in Russia, to wildfires, right? So both bleaching and wildfires are becoming more pre prevalent and likely with climate change. When forests burn, we go and plant them back. We don't grieve and move on. We don't triage them, we plant them all back because we are very sure that our livelihoods depend on the forest. When the corals reef bleach, we grieve, accept the loss and move on. This is not acceptable. We need to raise our ambition to the same ambition that we have for the rainforest of the ocean that we have for the rainforest of land. This is a simple message. It's a simplified message if you wish, but it's one that we need to face. Why is it that we have an ambition to plant a trillion trees on land, and yet the most ambition we are able to come up for the ocean is to plant five million corals? There's a difference of 10 to the nine in the level of ambition. What we are planning to plant on land is 300 times the total existing area of coral reefs. Are we going to accept that poor ambition? What should we do? Obviously, it's harder to uh, restore coral reefs than to restore forest. Everybody can engage in tree planting, but not everybody can go underwater, despite Fabian's grandfather's dream that everybody will be underwater to be able to plant coral reefs. But can we not engage the global population with this endeavor as we engage them with uh, the Trillion Tree Initiative? Can we not raise the boundaries of the possible? In fact, I was born in the 1960s 1960 actually in Lisbon, this is my hometown. And then in 1960s, this generation said that we need to be realistic. But to be realistic is not to accept that we're going to lose 90% of the ocean. In the 1960s, we said, be realistic, demand the impossible. So we need to demand the impossible because we have to. And the impossible, if we demand the impossible, we need to just redefine what are the boundaries of the possible. And refining the boundaries of the possible requires science and technology. So we can do that, and we have redefined the boundaries of the possible. Two years ago, 
a pandemic affect us all, uh, COVID, and claim many lives, and we did not triage the lives and accepted the losses. Nobody thought that a vaccine was possible within, within one year, but the vaccine was delivered within one year. Some people think that that was a miracle of science, but in fact, scientists that developed the vaccine, like uh, Kathleen Carioco, started working on mRNA vaccines 20 years ago. Nobody trusted that her research, her ideas were going anywhere, but this vaccine has saved many lives. So we need to redefine the boundaries of the possible. We need to raise the ambition. And the only way to do that is to, through science and technology, so we push the boundaries of what is possible. So it's not by triaging corals. I think we have uh, already identified 10% uh, of the world corals are resilient, but we cannot really give up on the other 90%. If that is the best that science can do today, that science is not good enough, and we need to redefine what science can do. And we have to do that through a global effort, and we have to do that through a global effort that brings together the best minds, not necessarily coral reef biologists, but possibly architects, probably engineers, probably others. We are now developing, delivering trees uh, by drones. Can we not plant uh, corals with drones? Is that impossible, right? So can we do not, can we not engage the best science and the best minds in the world with this endeavor, which is fundamental for generations to come? So this is my premise. This is my very simple and simplified statement. And my last stand for coral reefs is that we should raise the ambition and we should push the boundaries of what is possible and we need to do that together. Uh, uh, yesterday I was having a conversation about the concept of, uh, somebody was telling me about the uh, uh, reefs worth saving. And that concept actually troubled me because I think that every reef is worth saving. So I do not accept that I can go across to Sudan, for instance, and tell somebody a fisherman whose livelihood depends on the reefs, that your reefs are not worth saving. And we are not going to do anything to save your reefs. Yes, of course, as investors, you are interested in the safety of your investment, but the way we de-risk your investment is by improving science and technology so that we can improve the outcomes of your investment. And make sure that every reef is worth invested, it is worth saving, and every reef will be invested upon because we will have the tools to make your investment worthwhile there. So this is what we do at CORDAP with the contribution of all uh, organizations in the room. They are the ones that deliver the restoration and the conservation on the ground, but we have a mission to advance the boundaries of the possible in terms of what can we do to secure a future for the 90% of the coral reefs that we are now uh, with current science and technology not able to secure a future for. So we want to avoid the loss of coral reefs, and we, need to, we want to do that by inviting everyone to engage in, a, in an effort to develop the next best science and technology that can push the boundaries of the possible and find a future for the 90% of reefs that currently we believe cannot be, cannot be saved and even expand coral reef area beyond the current state. We need to have a trillion coral reefs planted as well as we have a trillion trees planted. And when the trillion tree initiative came up, everybody said that it was impossible. But just raising the ambition uh, was able to identify what are the bottlenecks, what are the critical elements that we need to overcome. And a lot of minds started working on how do we overcome those challenges. So we really need to raise, raise the ambition and we need to do that by science and technology and then make that science and technology openly available, make that equitable. So in CORDAP, we, we will have a mandate for all projects to have partners from uh, middle and low income nations at the same level as developing nations. So we invite them to participate in the process as well and use their talent and ingenuity as well to deliver the solutions. So we have a, a, a target of uh, our program is scaled to be about 30 million uh, per year. We are now at one third of that. Uh, we are working with the Global Fund with coral, for Coral Reefs and others. And on Thursday, we will uh, announce a, a, a partnership with the Global Fund for Coral Reefs to fundraise together and reach the target of our program because we must, we have a decade to solve this problem. 
and we will not accept that we're going to lose any single coral reef in the world. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you very much. Uh, should we go on to questions? I was thrown into this uh, role last minute. Thanks, Carol. Uh, I, so um, I have a, a few questions on this first panel. Let's, let's start with uh, Professor Duarte, actually. You, you mentioned my grandfather. My grandfather in 1997, the last year he was around, had mentioned that he could not bring my father to places he had seen when he was young because they didn't exist anymore. And similarly, my father said the same thing to me. And unfortunately, I'm saying the same thing to my daughter who's 10 years old. Yet, morally, and you touched on this very deeply, I have a very, really hard time accepting reality, accepting the real, the, the, what people say is realistic. And it goes into a, a question of what's realistic versus you know, what, what we can hope for. And, and anyone who, um, who's in the science world uh, tends to dismiss hope. But I will argue that hope is unrealistic, but being realistic is the enemy of accomplishing the impossible. And we've seen the impossible happen if we put our minds and our resources together. But how does one convince an esteemed panel here, an esteemed group such as this, a group of experts in the political arena, in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, in the university sector, to work together so that we can accomplish the impossible? It's a big question, but it's one that we have to tackle if we're going to go beyond the 10% of 10% of the coral reefs. Thank you. So maybe uh, drawing on the semantics of hope and so on, I think optimism is a, a kind of a life attitude that hopes that everybody, everything will be fine without anything. Hopes, uh, in contrast, it's like a verb that is a spell with the sleeves roll up. So hope comes with work and comes with effort. So I'm actually hopeful, but delivering my hope will require a lot of effort and will require a lot of hard work and pushing the boundaries of the possible. So uh, we, uh, two years ago, if we were in a forum discussing the future of COVID, nobody will be thinking that a vaccine will be delivered in one year. We will be thinking of a decade and how we defend ourselves during that decade and how many lives will be lost. Uh, ho how we make sure that more disadvantaged, disadvantaged people have access to treatments and so on. But uh, when, when uh, Kathleen Carico, which, whom, uh, with whom I was actually 10 days ago, uh, was working on the um, mRNA as a vehicle for vaccines, 20 years ago everybody told her it was impossible. She actually lost jobs, nobody funded her, so she lost jobs in US institutions because she was unable to get grants, because her ideas were crazy, they were impossible. Right? It took, it took a, a situation where there was no other option for somebody to listen to Kathleen Carico and start working on, on the mRNA vaccine that is the basis for Moderna and Pfizer. I think we all have, have those in the room, right? But it was impossible. It was impossible. And we, we uh, I think funders, and organizations only accepted to face the impossible when they had no other option. Do we have any other option for coral reefs? I believe we get to the last stand for coral reefs where we have no other option than to try the impossible. Yes. Um, I think we have to be careful with unlimited sort of optimism, right? And I think this is where it becomes quite tricky uh, because a sort of over-optimistic solution won't, it'll do just be the same as actually not acting. And so I think you need, you know, 
uh, comfortably to sort of work out what those limits are. And I think they stand side by side. You have some real sort of blue sky stuff that has to go ahead and you, you know, sink or, or, or float versus the way things like the initiative uh, are going, which is to sort of uh, manage the system as you, of course, stabilise greenhouse gas emissions, but keep those sort of vital sort of ignition cores going because it doesn't cost you a lot. It's not the same as trying to invent a, 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 ro a robo uh, coral. And so I think we have to be very careful with that. Anyway, that was just, um, um, there's, there's clearly a very good part of this is for debating, I think. So yeah. it's great. are possible and evaluates proposals and selects among the proposals the best proposals that can have a future. So it sounds a lot like a debate between resilience and restoration. Um, okay, so I had another question that, that you triggered uh, in, in this particular conversation. Um, I'm struggling with the word resilience. How do we define the word resilience, both internally and also for the general public? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Uh, Abura, where, all right, there you are, uh, it's just so we can hear from other panelists, or Jennifer, maybe. Okay, thank, uh, thank you. So that is an interesting question, and I've, so as a bit of background, I've been very much involved from 20 years ago in working on reef resilience and trying to develop and monitoring and assessment uh, processes to look at it. Um, scientists have a trouble with the term resilience because it's quite hard to define explicitly and to quantify it, and it's a bit of a relative concept, but people really understand resilience. It, it's a great concept, and resilience is the ability, ability to cope with threats, to bounce back from disturbances, and to continue on more or less the same as you were before or with the same functions. Maybe things change a bit over time. And I think it's a really important, it's a critical concept. It really helps, you can understand it at the planetary level, working a lot on planetary boundaries now and, and resilience of the planetary system. And you can talk about it at the local level in terms of how, how a reef is able to cope with the changes that are coming. And what changes we really understand actually take that place out of its comfort zone and make it impossible it to be the same as it was before and then you can think about well what kind of a new resilient system can we build up that is a good one and that sustains people and sustains new biodiversity as opposed to being you know a polluted or a sick place that doesn't really uh, help people move forward so i think resilience is a, is a critical concept i think restoration is a very important part of that and you can have restoration actions across the whole scope from maintaining the, uh, the natural resistance ability of a place to actually replacing, replacing bits that have gone because they've died off, such as corals. And I think that whole gamut is important to look at. And I think CORDAP is certainly considering that and many different resilience and restoration programs are looking across the whole scope now uh, for coral reefs and then in other systems as well. David did a great job of defining what resilience is, and I, I hit on resilience-based management, so it's taking those principles into account. What is the innate resilience of corals? How do you harness that, and how do you use that in your conservation um, activities, whether that is protecting areas that are already in good shape and keeping them from further decline or restoring highly degraded areas? So you had said the debate between resilience versus restoration. I don't think there's a debate there. Both are necessary, and it's a continuum of different types of conservation activities that you do. And I would also say that, you know, as, as people travel the world and discover where more corals are, we found out that corals themselves are incredibly resilient. We found corals at the mouth of the Amazon River that are in horrible water conditions, but they're thriving. You, you find corals in the Red Sea that have adapted to very high temperatures. We have corals that are in the upper parts of the Northern Marianas that are in um, very um, limiting environmental conditions that they've adapted to. So I think the corals themselves are amazing little buggers that are plastic, and they're gonna outwit us. And it's can we take those really resilient corals and make sure that we use those in our conservation and management plans. Thank you very much. Um, before I pass it on to uh, the floor for any questions here, uh, and just for the benefit of, of the live stream, 
and without taking it off the rails of climate specifically, but in my amateur observations out there diving since I was four, it seems and it feels like it's a much more complex discussion that the coral reef ecosystem is a four-legged stool. And if you knock one of those legs because of climate change, because of pollution, because of, of overconsumption of natural resources, overfishing, et cetera, the, if you give the, the, the coral reef ecosystem a break, it does have a tendency to resist one of those factors. But if you start inputting too many factors, that's when you have the, the major problems. So again, the impossible versus the resilience versus everything else. But I, I would love to uh, open this up to the floor to see if there are any actual questions. Ambassador. Well, thanks for that uh, fantastic panel presentation, really helpful. Uh, look, I was in Svalbard recently, and I saw uh, stuff coming out of the ocean, which the scientists present said to me, uh, we <laughs> expect to see this in the Atlantic. Uh, Svalbard, even though it's w up above the Arctic Circle, is now a North Atlantic ecosystem. And, of course, that is happening all around the world. That's no news to you guys. Uh, life is moving away from the poles, and uh, I'm sure all of you are experiencing that in some way. So to the poles, from the equator, from us in Fiji, <laughs> way south. If you live north of the equator, it's moving up north to Svalbard. <laughs> um, okay, so that makes me think, and this is all along the lines of what we were talking about earlier, of solutions that can be financed. You take uh, the coastline of Australia, for example. Is it possible to help nature by preparing landing grounds for coral further south from the Great Barrier Reef. You know, coral is tra travels as spores on ocean currents and all the rest. Or uh, Carlos's wonderful idea about uh, seeding by drones, you know, a trillion corals planted by dr underwater drones. I love that idea. But uh, the uh, technical question to the panel, can we help nature as life moves north and south away from the equator can we help nature uh, in, in terms of coral by preparing landing grounds for it? <laughs> um, I had an amazing experience. So I grew up in Sydney and was a skin diver and knew every nook and cranny on reefs around Manly. And there was never a coral there. There was a few little butterfly fish that came like Nemo down the East Australian current. Uh, I heard someone say to me, <coughs> referred to corals of Manly in Sydney, and sure enough, they've sparked up. You've got corals, you've got that. And so, th so you could potentially have uh, places where they could settle. Uh, red coralline algae, for example, are a preferred substrate for corals to settle. So you could sort of start to put this stuff out. But there's one problem, and that is that it's not about temperature only uh, in, in the region. You've got things like the alkalinity is very different to uh, where they come from on the, on, on the, on the reef. So there's a few stumbling blocks. So the corals are there. And when I went to see them, of course, I was amazed. But they, they're really nuggety little guys. Nuggly little buggers, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, they are certainly not the rich, lux luxurious coral you'd see. So I suppose just to, to end here, I suppose, yes, I suppose you could. Uh, whether it's the number one option you want to spend your money on, I, I guess that's the second question. And I think that lurks below the surface in a lot of what we're talking about here, is can you afford to do what we're doing? And, of course, you'll, you'll prove me wrong, and that'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I, I'd like to take you to the other shore of Australia, to the Indian Ocean, where I was uh, leading an institute during five years. So there we also see uh, corals crawling south along the shorelines of Perth and uh, Western Australia. But then they came uh, to displace kelps. So the outcry was about kelp dying off and being replaced by corals. And uh, so then we humans have a problem. Corals don't have a problem. They will be there when many human generations will be gone. They'll still be there. But the problem is for us that we will not have the corals to support our livelihoods, to defend our, our shorelines. The problem is that coral reef takes about 5,000 years to form. So we do have coral settling in, in uh, areas where they could not grow before, but it's going to take a long time before they are fully functional ecosystems. So yes, they will be there. There will be coral reefs 5,000 years from now still, but 
the problem will be that we'll have a number of human generations deprived of coral reefs. So yes, that will happen, but the problem is not that we need to help corals, and that we need to help us uh, cope with the changes and make sure that we help coral reefs that are still in existence continue to be functional. So that's, that's a challenge. I don't want to pr prove of wrong, but I think science advances by, by developing new concepts and superseding what was the status quo at one, plan, at one point by redefining the, the, the rate of the possible. So uh, I, I, I led a paper uh, two, years ago, two years ago called uh, Rebuilding Marine Life, where we pledged that it is possible to rebuild the abundance of, of marine life uh, in uh, human generation by 2050 by doing smart things, right? Coral reefs are the hardest component to rebuild. Maybe the fight is not to lose them, not to lose, but we can even push the boundaries and even hope at rebuilding, not just conserving. But one of the examples that gave me hope, and as I've said, there's optimism, but there's also hope, is that in 1978, we only had 200 humpback whales left in the ocean. And every biologist would thought, thought that they were doomed due for earmark for extinction. Now the International Whaling Commission established the moratorium. Now we have 40 years later, we have 60,000 humpback whales in the ocean. Yeah, in 1978, probably anybody would have said that it was impossible to save uh, humpback whales. It's not a small organism, it's a very large giant of the ocean. But we start seeing miracles coming over and over. If we don't lose hope, and do the needful in terms of work to uh, get the outcomes that we seek. So I'm very happy to prove myself wrong. I'm very happy to prove anybody wrong in as long as that brings better futures for our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you have a question? Yes. Hello. Hello, Simon Cripps, WCS. I'm really nervous about asking this question, but if I can't ask it here and get the, the world's experts to answer it, please don't take this as aggressively critical. It really isn't. I'm a scientist. I would love to be convinced. I worry about restoration in terms of replanting. I think that corals are more like whales in, than than um, forests, you can replant a forest. But I'm a gardener, you, you know, when a plant dies out in a particular part of your garden, you don't usually replant it because the conditions aren't right, the soil is wrong. And it worries me that we, we are working at too small a scale if we're just replanting little bits of coral. To me, oh he's gone, to me restoration is much bigger scale, reducing stresses um, in putting the right environment so that there can be restoration. I, I would be interested to be convinced if there is any benefit in actual reseeding, but for me it looks like restoration should be at a much bigger scale. Happy to be proved wrong. Great question. We actually have to do it at scale, but we also have to address why corals are in the condition that they are. You can't just use restoration as your recovery strategy. You have to address water quality issues, you have to address fishing, you have to address what's coming off the land. It's death by a thousand paper cuts at this point. So restoration is certainly part of a plan, but not the only part of your plan. And getting to the point where, where does planting corals make sense? It makes sense in areas where you've lost a lot of that structure, and even if you have corals that are still sexually reproducing, those gametes can't find each other anymore because they're too far apart. So areas like Florida, the Caribbean, we need to get that structure back out that brings in other ecosystem components and gives it sort of a kickstart to be able to self-sustain. So that's the strategy that we'll take in Florida and the Virgin Islands and the Caribbean will be different than what's happening in the Great Barrier Reef because they're in a different situation. So it's all about adapting these technologies and knowledge to be locally relevant and, and, and to work, but to your point, restoration isn't the end-all be-all. It is part of a comprehensive plan. So if I can make one quick point on that, it brings together a couple of other points in terms of change and how far into the future to look, especially thinking from an investor perspective about you know, how, how to de-risk investments and what will the conditions be like in 40 or 50 years. 
Now, there's a result that came out of the IPCC IPBES report that I was part of last year, and it's a paper we're trying to put out now because actually, so we call it climate velocity is the technical term for it. But it turns out that climate velocity, so the movement of a particular climatic sort of envelope, is about five times faster in the ocean than it is on land. And so, so corals and other marine species will move much larger distances than what we're seeing uh, terrestrial species doing. And that's really important for thinking about, okay, well, in terms of improving conditions for reefs and direct restoration, what should be done in place over here and what should be done 200 kilometers down the coastline uh, for this particular climate belt, you know, for where it's going to be in 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. So I think it's really important. The, the R&D on this is essential. If, if we don't do the research, we'll never have the answers. We do have to do that blue sky research on all types of restoration practices so that we have a portfolio to use as we need it further down the line. I think it's very important to invest in that. Yeah, thank you, thank you Julien Marco um, from WWF. Um, I just wanted to go back to the conversation on the possible versus impossible, because um, this is absolutely something I find uh, very challenging in any conversation, particularly with the public and with the youth. And the communication side of that conversation is so important. That narrative is so important that we get it right, because the youth in particular is now oscillating between doom and gloom and uh, naivety, and is a very uh, complicated emotional uh, um, a shift for, for many of them, delivering, as you know, this kind of new eco-anxiety feeling of wanting to do more, getting angry from not seeing action, and at the same time, not really be sure that anything can be done. So getting their narrative right, and I have to say, in, in, in our experience at WWF, it's, more about, it's not either or. It's not either aiming for the impossible or try to prioritize for what's actually we know is possible. It's actually embracing both. And Investing in what we know can work is absolutely a must, but at the same time, I completely agree, try to redefine what actually impossible means and leaving that space open for increased impact over time is, is equally important. So I, I, you know, I kind of felt in that discussion there was a kind of either or, is either possible or impossible. Actually, let's embrace both because we have an urgent crisis, we need to act on where we know we can make a difference now, but at the same time, we need to really push for, for more because uh, accepting 90% of coral reefs loss is just not what I was born with in my own um, uh, <laughs> vision of the world. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was thinking to myself, one of the questions I wanted to ask the panel, which I probably won't, but want to, is how comfortable you all are in moving between the science and the emotion. Because I hear words that are emotional, I hear hope, I hear, optimism, I hear love, I hear these other things, right? The next generation, the ones who will have this charge are not as afraid to co-mingle their upset and their anger over this intergenerational injustice with the science. And so when we do talk about resilience, it does resonate, right? And if it's hard to explain, we gotta get over that. We gotta get right through and find out what they think impossible is, right? Because if we don't actually recruit them to this task, the science won't matter. And it is encouraging to me, but I, but I know that, un, that, that discomfort with mixing science and hope. And I'm sad, but I'm optimistic, but I have science, but I don't know what to do with it, right? We have to get better at that. And we may not in our lifetimes, but those that are gonna actually have this task are more comfortable working in that fluid space. And so I welcome the discomfort to ask them what they believe is impossible, impossible, and what resilience means to them, because we're timing out, right? The corals may not be, but it'll be up to the next generation to ensure that. Yeah, th that's a great point. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we have to base our decisions on facts and science, but emotions is what drives action. So you're absolutely right. Uh, that, that, that was the crux of, of why I was talking about the impossible in the beginning. Um, I know we have to, to move forward on um, on the next panel, which is Resilient Reefs and Resilient Communities. So with that, I'm gonna pass the mic over to my co-host. Thanks, Fabian. 
We have Carl Deering now from Care International. I think we've talked about one aspect uh, more on the ecosystem side and the impact. I think it's really important to think about this challenge is also from a gender and a people perspective and a social development lens as well. So if you'd like to welcome Carl, please. Thanks, Carol. Uh, this is on the mic. Um, thanks for the introduction and, and, uh, and, and greetings to, to fellow panelists and, and uh, distinguished guests. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. I work with CARE. Uh, it's not the kind of space that CARE normally floats around in um, marine science. Uh, CARE is an international development and humanitarian agency, but we're very proud to be working with WWF for more than 15 years now on the nexus of conservation and development. And uh, this is one of our more exciting programs. When I told uh, management that um, I wanted CARE to, en to engage with the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative, they, their eyes rolled and, and said, what would we be doing uh, on a program like that until I told them um, the numbers, the data that we have on, on uh, dependency uh, of communities on, uh, on reef systems and uh, particularly uh, vulnerability data and, uh, um, uh, and, and particularly gender-based vulnerability. So I've just got three things to say. Um, I've got a cameo with no slides. <clears throat> One is a particular challenge uh, around uh, so social equity issues, and I was really glad, David, that you brought up the issue of equity earlier. Uh, the second issue is that we have solutions to this challenge, and then a brief note on the opportunity in front of us. Um, the challenge is related to the fact that um, climate change impacts people in different ways for different reasons in different places at different times of the year. And the most acute manifestation of that differential vulnerability is based on gender. If you are a woman dependent on coral reef uh, fisheries, you are immediately more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change because of other intersectional and compound vulnerabilities. So. Uh, that's basically the challenge, and, and um, I won't go into the detail here because uh, uh, the, the, the sort of the d denial of rights and, and, uh, and restrictions on access to resources, to incentives, to rewards uh, for women and men in uh, small-scale coastal fisheries are well documented, and it's unacceptable. And that's no different from terrestrial agriculture, where CARE has most of, uh, of its experience. But what we have, and this is the good part, is we have solutions. And yesterday, uh, Ambassador, I was <clears throat> impressed the way you, uh, the, the way you mentioned that uh, pollution is fixable, uh, overfishing is fixable. Well, gender inequality is fixable, and we have proven solutions to be able to do that. Um, and we've been working with with conservation partners, uh, as I said, for a decade at least with WWF on uh, on, fi on applying those solutions. And it brings multiple returns in terms of food security, nutrition, mobility, access to health, lots and lots of societal and developmental benefits if gender inequality is tackled head on. Um, during the design phase of the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative, we engaged with, uh, with the gender team at uh, James Cook at the Centre of Excellence, uh, James Cook University, as well as gender specialists at World Fish and the gender team at CARE. And we found, we looked into the, the specifics of, of gender-based uh, vulnerability in coral reef systems, and we looked at solutions through a framework, and that framework looks for change across three domains. The first domain is agency, human agency. So actions addressing the capacities, the knowledge, uh, the information, the confidence, the esteem that women have uh, and men have uh, in, in reef systems. So uh, an innovative model that we have in terrestrial agriculture, for example, is farmer field and business schools. And we are really excited about the, the possibilities of dragging that learning and that model into, uh, into the coral reef program because we have seen, uh, as I say, returns in terms of uh, household health, um, um, uh, increased incomes, increased production, um, increased mobility for women and reductions in gender-based violence. And I think that that is, a, is an issue that we should all take note of because there are, there are expectations and, and responsibilities um, uh, to address uh, uh, gender-based violence in all of our programming. Uh, 
The second domain is structures. It's uh, actions that uh, would promote uh, women's voice and leadership in, in the governance of, uh, of natural resources and, and, uh, and coral reef um, management. So that could be uh, community-based natural resource management committees as well as, uh, for example, subnational and national um, formal structures for governance, um, opening spaces for women's leadership and voice uh, in those processes. And the third domain, and this is where it does become tricky, or not tricky, but, but a bit more complex, and the conservation community, as well as many in the development community, have, have, have tend to shy, shy away from this. And it's the, it's the issue, the domain of relations, human relations, particularly intimate partner relations at household level, and it's to do with overcoming or tackling harmful social norms and barriers that underpin inequality and that deny women access to resources or, uh, or mobility, for example, or decision-making power over uh, uh, income. Um, the opportunity, let me stop on the, uh, the solutions. Uh, as I say, we're excited about applying these. Uh, the opportunity for applying these, these uh, gender transformative approaches um, are, 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 are here in this Coral Reef Rescue Initiative. And um, it is the frontier of, uh, of good practice in, in, in food systems transformation. Um, it's got a lot of traction uh, within uh, the Committee on Food Security and all of the uh, Food Systems uh, Summit dialogues last year. Um, so there are, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more interest in this area. And if we do want uh, resilient reefs and resilient uh, um, ecosystems, we need resilient communities and resilience, and it's fascinating the discussion earlier about the definition of resilience in ecosystems. In human development, the definition is about uh, anticipation, absorption, adaptation to shocks and stresses, but it's also about transformation. Transformation is a key part of the resilience paradigm within human development. And to do that, we have to tackle these three domains, the relations, the structures, and the agency. Uh, I'm really excited about the possibilities, and, uh, and the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative, I think, is, is, uh, is going to be at the forefront of, uh, of dragging that learning from the development world into, into uh, conservation, um, because we do know that the more gender equal a society is, the more food secure it is as well. Thanks. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Carl. We have two more speakers left, and then uh, we will finish the event. Uh, there's another event happening right after this. We have from the Green Climate Fund, Professor Kevin Horsberg, to share. Thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and I should say I'm delighted to be here both on behalf of the fund but also personally because before I joined the fund just over a year ago, uh, I was a research oceanographer for 25 years. So these issues are, to, to me, um, very, very personal. Um, so with that, I'm delighted to be able to say that the fund has been able to invest uh, 125 million US dollars into the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, which is a unique uh, public private ship partnership model, um, the intention being that we use that GCF funding to crowd in significant um, additional private investment funding alongside an already existing um, grant window which is publicly funded, which is being well managed by a number of UN agencies, UNDP, uh, UNEP, UNCDF, um, and to bring these things together uh, to form a substantial fund um, in support of um, sustainable businesses um, to protect coral reefs, effectively to provide, um, using Fabian's analogy, um, three of those legs of the stool as best we can to strengthen those other three legs. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about the fund and its structure and some of its uh, novelty in a second, um, ending on some very good news. I'll, I'll leave that, uh, that hanging. Um, but just to, to take things back to when the fund was being proposed, within the GCF we, re we receive proposals um, and we assess those proposals and part of my job is looking for the evidence base. So for adaptation proposals, we, we, we not, not surprisingly, um, re we require there to be an evidence based analysis of the, of the proposal. Uh, and normally that requires some, some iteration. Um, 
With the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, I'm delighted to say, and it's a tribute to all of the great science that's, uh, that's been done and that's represented in this room, um, that that wasn't an issue for a, for a nanosecond. I mean, the proposal that we saw was replete with the strongest scientific backing, a lot of it coming from the IPCC report, um, to make the, you know, the evidence base for this, the science that's behind it, um, incontrovertible. Um, and then very pleased to be able to say that we worked with um, our partner on this, Pegasus, and with others like the WWF and, and UNDP, uh, to then sort of structure the business side of the fund around how it would make its investment in three primary areas, sustainable ocean production, uh, sustainable ecotourism, and sustainable infrastructure, uh, waste management, and circular economy. So in, in so doing, uh, strengthening three of those legs of the stool in order to pull coral reefs as far away as possible from the tipping point um, being induced by climate change. Um, so the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, you will hear a lot about it this week, I think. Um, it's, it's a first in many ways uh, for us and also for the community. Um, it's the first at scale private sector investment in the blue economy, in, in coral reefs specifically. Um, it's the first multi-country program uh, focusing on sustainable oceans. Uh, for ourselves, for the fund, it's, it's, it's one of the largest equity investments that we've made, investing 125 million in order to leverage, hopefully, up to 500 uh, million. And uh, it's also one of the first investments where we've designed that investment window alongside an already, already existing um, technical assistance window, which is a, a good model for being able to design quality projects, quality investments, which the, the equity fund can then invest in. So all of that um, marks out the Global Fund for Coral Reefs as a, a first of its kind. And I think I just want to finish um, by sharing a piece of news. Um, so w without, uh, w without sending the room to sleep with, uh, with the, uh, the bureaucracy of our processes, um, when proposals are finally approved, we have what's called a funding accreditation agreement. Um, once that is enacted, um, then that's a commitment to spend the money. And I'm very pleased to say that yesterday the, the legalese was finally signed off. The FAA is, is effective as of yesterday, um, and, and we can now um, with confidence, expect that fund to go ahead. Uh, I'm a physical oceanographer. I don't know what the timescales for crowding in private investment are, um, but, that, but that catalytic capital is now there, and we hope uh, that it will catalyse uh, the, the remainder of that fund to, uh, to then invest in significant uh, high-quality businesses um, in sustainable coral reefs. Thanks very much. We have a slight change in the program. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez had a conflict and uh, we'll be making an announcement together in the media zone at three o'clock. And so, but today we have uh, Marco Lambertini, uh, who is a part of the WWF uh, family and our director general making a small announcement on some of the progress we've made with the Jeff. Thank you very much. This is gonna be quite an unusual and uh, uh, role to play. <laughs> to say the least, and you will understand in a minute why, because uh, the CEO and the chairperson of uh, uh, the GF, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, you all know, asked me uh, to make an announcement I should have made. <laughs> and so the announcement is actually quite exciting because um, uh, GF7 uh, has actually approved the Coral Reef uh, Rescue Initiative uh, for six countries, uh, Fiji, Solomon Islands, Indonesia, Philippines, Tanzania, Madagascar. Uh, the partnership is very exciting as well. Many are around this room. It's um, Rare, uh, uh, Wilder Conservation Society, CARE International, Blue Ventures, University of Queensland, and WWF. And the amount, and now this is the temptation to double the amount straight away, but I don't think I'm allowed to do that. So I'll stick to the amount, I'll stick to the amount that I was told <laughs> to announce. That is of $7.8 million. Um, so it's a foundational investment. It's super exciting will build on that. And I cannot um, uh, uh, also um, uh, for forget to mention that this has been made possible by a number of other donors that inputted at a very early stage into this initiative. And one is just beside me, Philippe Prufer is the, the head of the uh, IEP Foundation, Brazilian. And so thank you, Philippe, for making this happen. And thank you particularly, Jeff Seven, for this great contribution to the initiative. So that's my announcement. <laughs>
Thank you, Marco. Um, we'll be coming down to the closing end of our uh, program today. Um, Ambassador Peter Thompson unfortunately had to leave, and he just thanks everybody for attending today. He really enjoyed the discussion and the panelists, and he'd love to reconvene this group because I think there's a lot more to be discussed and to harness from this group as well. So he just wanted to personally thank everybody for being here. And I just wanted to thank our co-organizers as well, ICRI and CORDAP and the GFCR and WWF and the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative partners as well who made the time to be here and to share their knowledge and experience as well. And I have Fabian to help me close as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carol. Uh, you've been uh, a good friend and inspiration to all of us and, and of course, to the Coral Reefs. Um, on my behalf, uh, having taken up uh, third, being third generation ocean explorer, uh, and Voice for the Ocean. Uh, it's an absolute blessing to be amongst all of you today and to see how much work is being done to help shepherd the health of our ocean, especially the coral reefs and its creatures who do not have a voice to fend for themselves. We have a lot to do, and we need to work together. Uh, I know that it's very easy to walk away from these kinds of groups and start concentrating on our daily lives and be distracted by the things that uh, we must focus on. But at the end of the day, we're not gonna get out of this without working together. And it's not about the coral reefs. It's not even about nature. It's about ourselves. And by that I mean that if we are to give back to our future generations what we've taken for granted, if we are to imagine a better place for our children, for the next generations, than we found it, then selfishly, that self-preservation aspect is all about conservation. This is a closed loop system. And we need to start with the fundamentals so that we can gather the general public to be part of our team. We have to change the language. There is no such thing as throwing something away. It's a closed loop system. We live on little oasis in space. We're seeing those repercussions. We should stop calling things seafood. It's objectifying the value that those tangible assets, that natural resource bank account that we depend on, that's going bankrupt. There are no bailout loans. So just with these concepts, to be able to call things sea life, to be able to look at coral reefs as rainforests and all the value, that Pandora's box of discoveries left in front of us that will give us the ability to tackle in innovative ways the challenges that we face today. It's essential for all of us to pool our resources and to work together. And with that, it is absolutely humbling to be amongst all of you and to listen to the richness that you bring to the table. But we have a long road ahead of us, and we need to make the impossible possible. So with that, I would love to see us get back together at some point soon with a task, with a, a singular goal that we can all reach and we can all accomplish, and we can report back next time. I don't know what that is, and I will not task you with it because it's not my responsibility. But I would be happy to participate in that task with you all as a community, as a global community, for the betterment of our next generations. So thank you all so very much, uh, and I look very much forward to progress and to making the place a better place for our children. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.